If you want to shoot at a very long distance, there's a lot of factors that short shooting distances won't allow you to experience the impacts of. Not really. At long distances, ballistics is a dance where various bits of physics fight against each other. And understanding how to connect requires you to understand each of them and how to adjust for them. By the end of this series, you're going to be able to come up with your own ballistic solution and know the basics of connecting at a distance, so you can go out to a range with a long-distance target and consistently hit it. Speaking of things that are consistently hitting, Patreon! Go ahead and check mine out, because there is consistently a bunch of awesome stuff going up on there, and it is the best way to support the channel. Alright, let's get into it. Every bullet is different. I don't just mean different calibers are different. It's pretty easy to see, just putting a 9mm and a 30 6 side by side, that they do different things. But it gets much, much stranger than that. Say I asked you to hand me a box of 45 ACP, and I don't look, I just accept whatever rounds you hand me. If I pulled out a bullet, I would know exactly one thing, that it fits in guns, chambered for 45 ACP. I wouldn't be able to tell you how fast the bullets go. I wouldn't be able to say how much powder is in it. I wouldn't be able to say how heavy it is, how much it drops over various distances, or even what it's made out of without investigating it. Hell, being technical, I couldn't even truly guarantee without knowing more about its manufacture that you could fire it out of the gun it chambers into without essentially having a bomb on my hands. Pun not intended. The common measurement of accuracy is an MOA or said longhand one minute of accuracy. An MOA is simple, roughly one inch at 100 yards. Take a gun, put it in a super comfortable prone setup so you're only measuring the gun and not your own skill, and shoot at a 100 yard target in a controlled environment, and you're going to get groups of basically one inch circles. That is how accurate the gun is. A gun that is sub-MOA will have a group that is smaller than one inch. A half-MOA rifle, for example, will be able to put a group no larger than a half-inch circle. The MOA group expands from there. A gun with one MOA at 200 yards will have a two-inch group. At 300 yards, we'll have a three-inch circle for a group. At 400 yards, you're at four inches. And at 1,000 yards, your groups are going to be 10 and a half-inch circle, don't forget that .05 comes back to tilt things at long distances. Another unit used when describing accuracy and adjusting shot placement is milliradians, also known as millirads, or mills for short. Millirads are an adjustment more common at longer distances. A radian is the length of a radius of a circle applied to its circumference. That angle is one radian. Fun fact, half of a circle fits a little more than three radians. In fact, you can fit pi radians in each half circle. Split that angle up into the thousandths and apply a dash of Latin roots and your radian becomes a milliradian. Milliradians are a big unit over the same distance, at least compared to MOA. They're more commonly used at very long distances. There are scope manufacturers that will use one or the other in a variety of different scopes. But the important math to remember is that one milliradian is equal to 3.43 minutes of angle. And with that math, you can kind of see why it's used a lot more at longer distances where the unit makes more sense. Bullets are defined by a handful of terms, some of which we've gone over already in other videos. Hollow points are bullets with a cavity that expands on impact, while a full metal jacket describes a single lead ball covered in a jacket of brass. These terms aren't mutually exclusive, by the way. Most modern hollow point rounds often have a full metal jacket and are occasionally referred to as jacketed hollow points. When described like that, jacketed hollow points are opposed by jacketed ball ammunition, referencing that full metal jacket is, on a basic level, a ball of metal. 
The phrasing is also to distinguish them from the half-jacketed hollow point rounds that have a copper jacket on the outside, but an exposed lead core on the hollow point itself. Half-jacketed hollow points are easier to manufacture and are often cheaper at the expense of suffering from stuffing, where the, the rounds collected material in the cavity. Bullets have been recovered that have the hollow point stuffed full of jacket fibers with no expansion and revealed that the combination of the bullet shape, material, clothing choice, and bad luck can result in the bullet collecting enough fibers to enter through a fluid as a solid, unchanging mass. Zeroing and height over bore are concepts that will drastically affect how rounds impact. So, the bore is the center of the rifle. Bore sighting is sticking a laser to the bore and sighting based on that. However, you'll notice the scope isn't actually looking down the barrel. The scope is, depending on the optic, the mount, and the gun itself, some distance above the barrel. Your zero is where the angle of the optic and the bore meet. That's where your optic's crosshairs are actually connecting. Other distances will either have a holdover, you have to hold the gun above what you're aiming at, or a hold under, the same thing in reverse. And that is assuming the optic is mounted directly above the gun. One of the reasons a lot of military surplus setups are such a pain to work with is you have to choose either, one, you don't get to use clips anymore, or two, you have to move the optic out of the way of the mag hole. That has also has two ways to go. You can mount the scope forward and away from the shooter, or you can make your height over bore a constant nightmare and offset the scope. The scope is now back and by your eye, but now you aren't just thinking about your rifle being mounted under what you're aiming at, it's under and right to the optic, which means if you zero properly at any distance, you have both hold over, hold under, and hold right, hold left distances as the bullet now arcs in a different path from the scope, making any sort of rapid adjustment its own mini-nightmare. Another term you've likely heard before is grains. One gram is 15.432 grains. It's easy to remember if you need that specificity with the shifted countdown. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 move the one, that's the gram to grain conversion out to three places. That said, for most use cases, thinking of a gram as 15.4 grains will be enough for most of the math that you'll be doing. That specificity really comes into play only at very long ranges. Boat tail is another term you'll likely hear. Ammunition having a boat tail means the back of the bullet returns to something like a point in order to improve something called the ballistics coefficient. The ballistic coefficient is a numeric representation of how well a bullet flies through the air. Ballistics coefficients are going to get their own video. They're that important. But essentially, it's a calculation of how much a bullet will be pushed by the wind over distance. A couple useful reference points for ballistic coefficient. G1 is the most common standard used. The single highest ballistic coefficient of a small arm round you can buy from a factory as of writing this in July 2024 is the 50 BMG A1 match ammunition made by Hornady using a 750 grain bullet and a G1 BC of 1.05. 308 Nosler match ammunition, uh, an average, very accurate round, has a G1BC of 0.50. In 556, the bullets I almost always use are M855 because they're so effective and so cheap, and in some cases, you can't find cheaper training ammo. My M855 has a G1BC of 0.304. This also answers why some rounds might surprise you, and despite their size, end up having significantly less range than you might expect. Take 4570 Government, for example. With enough experience and time, you can walk rounds in it at to much farther distance. 
it, but it's basically out of ballistic steam if you try to shoot past 300, 315 yards, depending on which weight grain you're using. At 300 yards, a 4570 round is dropping two and a half feet. At that point, you're aiming a half a person above everything else that you're shooting at and either adjusting in your scope and therefore missing at shorter distances or adjusting in your head and having to work much harder as a result. The reason for this is the ballistic coefficient of 4570, which, all right, let's be as generous as we can be. Hornady makes a modern version of this with a better shaped bullet, and that has a G1BC of 0.175. Now, bullet weight has a complicated effect on how bullets are affected by an explosion. Lowering the grain weight means, in most cases, that the speed goes up. There's exceptions when you get to the edges, but that's a good rule of thumb. However, lighter bullets also carry less momentum. Momentum as a unit is literally a product of mass and speed. And the unit for momentum is weight per distance over time, or speed when it had funky sex with weight. Importantly, we think of the world as a thing that is empty, but we're all basically swimming constantly through a material that exists around us. We only really know its presence through its absence, but it's important to remember the atmosphere has a physical existence that we all swim in. Fun fact, we think of solids, liquids, and gases as three separate material types because that's how they're separated in school, but in a lot of cases in physics where liquid and gases act similarly, they are just called fluids and are treated much more similarly in models. So remember, you're not just surrounded by a gas, you're surrounded by so much gas that it acts like a large fluid. If you've ever stuck your hand out the car window, you can experience the air's ability to physically push and pull. And that's a car moving at 60 miles per hour. That 4570, for example, moves at 1,261 miles per hour. But it has a really low ballistic coefficient. The ballistic coefficient's effect makes much more sense when you remember it's moving that fast and the outside of the bullet has to physically push that much mass through the air. Larger, heavier bullets might leave the barrel slower but they chug through the air at a more consistent rate, while the lighter version of the same bullet can also generate a benefit, less drop over distances there faster, in exchange for losing that speed faster. To truly get the benefit of light weight, you need to also make the bullet physically smaller so it pushes less air. 6.5 Creedmoor exists to try and do just this. The Creedmoor Armory took 308 and put a physically smaller bullet in the front reducing its ballistic impact at a lot of ranges in exchange for starting at a much higher speed. And, yes, while faster bullets lose speed at a higher rate than slower, heavier bullets, very high speeds are still very high speeds, and lowering speeds matter less when you start stratospherically higher. When you're trying to figure out a ballistic solution, Barometric pressure is the name of the game. That air the bullet is swimming through, how much of it exists in the path is going to matter, and how much air there is in a fixed volume of space is another way of saying air pressure, which you measure with the barometer, hence barometric pressure. First of all, your elevation. A sniper on the top of a tall mountain and a sniper in an island trench are going to have wildly different air pressures to deal with. Weather is also going to affect barometric pressure on a deep level. For one, air pressure affects rain, not the other way around. At a low pressure, the air has more space, which means more liquid can be held as a vapor. Add the pressure, and the water will condensate, and boom, rain. Temperature also has a unique effect on air pressure. Cold air is denser, so when settled, the cold air will have a higher pressure. However, it's denser because the air itself is moving less. Excited hot air, or dense hot air will have a higher pressure than stable hot air, so shooting through things like jet wash or thermal vents can result in either destabilization of your spin or displacement of the bullet itself. 
Humidity also changes the math, too. If there's more water in the air, there's less air, and from a ballistic perspective, it will fight the bullet less. That said, it's worth noting that at 800 yards, changing humidity from 100% to 2% will change your MOA adjustment between 0.1 and 0.5. It is only really a factor when you're discussing incredibly long-distance accuracy and hyper-precise shooting situations. Wind is important in a couple of different ways. First of all, there's the traditional left-right nature of pushing bullets. Adjusting for that push is called, wait for it, windage. You have two factors to adjust for, speed of wind and speed of angle. Wind directly at you or directly behind you is a non-factor in windage. On a 90-degree angle, we call that full value. The entire strength of the wind pushes the bullet. At a 45-degree angle, we call that half value, and the wind affects things about half as much as it does at the full value 90 degree wind. Real quick, um, just chiming in there, I got something a little bit wrong there, so 90 degree wind is full wind, 30 degree wind is half wind, 45 degree wind is actually three quarter value. That That's going to be important later. There's a secondary category of windage that you have to adjust for. Most barrels are rifled to the right. Bullets shot at very long distances have a tendency to ride the wind if they are pushed towards it. Most guns, especially in the U.S., will have a right-hand twist. Basically, it spins the bullet to the right. So wind going from left to right is going to push the round to the right and up a little bit, while wind going to the left will push it left and down a little bit. This isn't particularly noticeable at shorter distances, but it's important when you start stretching out to 800 meters and beyond. Speaking of things that only affect the bullet at extreme distances, the Coriolis effect. At 500 meters and beyond, you start interacting with a quirk of living on a ball spinning at 66,600 miles per hour. Although it's really only going to start biting you with hyper-precision shooting at those distances or defensive hunting shots at roughly double that distance. So take this here. We are shooting at a target from a thousand meters away. When the bullet is in the air, it's not connected to the planet. And the planet is spinning. That bullet has to physically fly through the air to reach its target, which takes time. At a thousand meters, M80 ball out of a 16-inch barrel is going to take roughly two seconds to get to its target after you pull the trigger. That's two seconds of the planet spinning at 66.6 thousand miles per hour. So by the time the bullet travels those two seconds, the entire planet has shifted. Importantly, the more your firing line is pointed at either pole, the most this will affect you. And along the east-west axis, the less you'll have to deal with this effect. Match-grade ammo, also called match ammo, is not necessarily more powerful than its non-match equivalent. What it is, is consistent. This is a group with M80 ball, and this is the same gun at the same distance, but with 308 match ammo. Match ammo is more expensive, not because it's inherently more powerful than normal ammunition, but because a lot more effort goes into guaranteeing the same amount of powder in each cartridge. The bullets themselves are also often the most aerodynamic form factor option available, and even if they use the same bullet shape, they are often made with stricter tolerances for balancing the weight of the projectile. It's also worth pointing out that there are a lot of loadings that you can find a wide amount of variance for. Don't just take a loading specification on face value. At bare minimum, look up what the manufacturer says about it, but optimally, test the velocity yourself. There's also the supersonic threshold. So when a bullet is moving faster than the speed of sound, there is a shockwave that is generated behind it. That shockwave is partially where the sound of a gun comes from. But there's a fascinating problem. As the bullet speed slows during the course of its travel, at some point it's going to cross the supersonic speed barrier and become what we call subsonic. And when that happens, the sonic boom that's been following it is air clapping because it only moves at the speed of sound. So when it goes subsonic, it's going to get pushed by the wave of air that is catching up with it. And how it will get pushed is a little randomized. This will impact accuracy 
and possibly even destabilize the bullet. If you're curious, most pistol rounds will have a maximum effective range of... It's complicated. So on the one hand, you as a person with noodly arms and a lack of any sort of optic are likely going to struggle with distances beyond 50 meters from a handgun. Some people can do better than this, but there's a lot of training for a beginner to get from here to there, and frankly, this series isn't about that skill specifically. Put the same round in something with a stock where you can pull it into yourself and you can suddenly get out to 200-ish meters with some training but not become John Wick levels of training. At that distance, there is a lot of drop, and basically every handgun round is running out of steam ballistically. It's not not lethal, but it's also doing a lot less damage, and you really need to be talking about the off-box. So if pistols aren't good, what calibers would I recommend? What guns should you be looking at for a long-distance solution? Can you use Milserp, or would you be better off using something consumer-grade? Does a bolt action make sense for you, or should you consider something semi-automatic? How do you set up the U for long-distance shooting? All of these questions and more will be coming in this series, reaching out and touching people. We're going to be going through a handful of sensible long-distance setups and discussing why they're good or bad or what they are good at and what they are bad at. We are going to be using some of the better and some of the worst examples to connect at longer distances, and we will go through some of the process of connecting at range. But importantly, this is not the end of your practice. This is barely the start. This is useful information only if you apply it. Go find a range with longer targets to practice on and actually practice. There are people who don't know any of this shit as the scientific terms I've been using, they just have shot every day for 40 years and know what bullets do in their bones. They will always outshoot you until you practice for a long time. This is information that can feel like a lot, but when you take it on, it becomes stuff you almost automatically think through when you shoot at a distance. Anyway, I'm definitely not getting this shit monetized. So, first of all, go sign up for Patreon, please and thank you. But more importantly, a gigantic shout-out to Sodded Lanternfly, who has sponsored this series in particular. A, a lot of the bullets that were shot were purchased with sponsorship money from them, as well as range day fees and gas, and just uh, so much support. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, if you want to support me, though, the best place is on Patreon. These folks are the reason I get to keep making videos. And shout out to Molly McAllister and Marshall Nye, the folks in my shout out gang. Woo -woo! You can get your name here or just any silly message by joining us over on Patreon. You could have your name here. This could be different. What happened to us? No, I appreciate y'all. And I'll see y'all next time. But that's going to be it for me. Stay dangerous, y'all. Keep each other safe. And remember, moral doesn't mean legal. And Stonewall was a fucking riot. Peace.